Good afternoon, I'm Neil Clark, Extension Forester for Southeast Virginia. Today we're going to talk about snags in our forest. So what's a snag, you say? So today we're going to learn about what a snag is, uh, why it's significant, and why uh, we should uh, keep some on the landscape. So a snag by some um, researchers is just considered a standing dead tree. Uh, however, you'll, you'll learn as we go on that uh, every snag is not created the same and that a snag is not a, is not a snag is not a snag. Some have gone beyond that to say a standing tree with some dead components that can be used as a cavity. Uh, and yet other researchers have gone on to place uh, diameter and height um, specifications uh, on the standing dead tree. Uh, that are useful for different species. So the reason we, ha we desire snags in our forested landscape uh, are for wildlife benefits primarily. Uh, birds are the obvious users of snags, but also several species of mammals. Uh, think squirrels and bats and even bears, uh, as well as lizards, frogs, uh, bees and insects of many varieties. Uh, all use uh, standing dead trees for different purposes, whether that be nesting, roosting, uh, perching, uh, or foraging. So typically it's not until the uh, snags reach uh, the size and stature uh, that they're beneficial for wildlife uh, that, that snags are really looked at uh, in detail. Oftentimes unique features of a snag are desired, whether that be uh, dead heartwood uh, that's sometimes present in snags, uh, the, whether the soft wood, uh, the, the portion of the, the wood just under the bark, whether that's uh, hard or soft, um, has different influences. Uh, the bark exfoliation uh, factors. So uh, as in, you will see later on uh, that there are some uh, snags like the one that you see beside me here is a for a pine snag is a relatively recent snag uh, you can see at the top of the tree uh, where there are still some fine twigs and branches left and uh, along the entire bowl uh, all the bark is still intact over time you will see where that uh, will change so the heartwood uh, and the heart rot uh, that is sometimes present is important for primary excavators. So these are primarily uh, woodpeckers. Now uh, for a large woodpecker, uh, pileated woodpeckers, uh, they actually tend to prefer uh, hard trees uh, that, that maybe don't even exhibit uh, heart rot. Uh, they, they will go into solid wood and sometimes prefer a harder wood. Uh, for hairy woodpeckers and northern flickers, usually the heart rot uh, needs, to be, to, needs to be present. And then the soft wood on the, the outer uh, portion of the, of the tree um, then also will provide a foraging substrate. So as the tree uh, continues to decay uh, and is connected to the ground, uh, more insects uh, tend to use this tree uh, either for uh, reproduction where well, there's a lot of larvae in this um, material and, uh, and if it's connected to the ground maybe even matures uh, mature beetles and things that will uh, crawl up and down the bowl. Then you have uh, secondary cavity users which would be like chickadees and nuthatches and wrens, um, titmice and uh, squirrels and uh, owls. Bats tend to desire uh, snags more uh, for the exfoliating bark. So bats uh, tend to use uh, forests and uh, these large trees and snags in the summertime and they will uh, tend to roost during the daytime behind this exfoliating bark uh, occasionally in cavities. Uh, they tend to like uh, large trees that are exposed to a lot of sun. The sun provides solar radiation that helps them regulate their body temperature and use less energy. 
You will also see uh, different birds using snags. You'll see vultures using snags uh, as they extend their wings to sun uh, their wings and exhibit that behavior. You'll often see birds of prey, hawks and eagles uh, perched in and snags that helps give them a uh, large uh, visual uh, extent where they can monitor prey. Uh, and you'll also uh, you'll see other birds such as the great blue heron use uh, large sections of snags usually near water uh, where they will establish their rookeries so their nests as well but a uh, an extensive heron rookery is quite uh, a sight to behold. So for certification standards such as FSC and SFI um, usually do account for uh, snags in their management plans. Um, most standards uh, suggest leaving two to five large stems of the uh, dominant species uh, and gotten further information from Dr. Jim Parkhurst who uh, thankfully uh, contributed uh, a good amount of uh, information for this program uh, that he would suggest to leave uh, hardwoods and softwoods as, as both different uh, tree species provide uh, these different characteristics needed over time. A snag obviously once it's a, once it's a fully dead snag uh, is a pretty temporal structure. So uh, it's not going to last very long, and particularly pines uh, do not tend, depending on the soil and environment, uh, do not tend to, to stay standing uh, long. And um, likewise, uh, for certain uh, hardwoods, uh, they're not very long-lived. This obviously uh, would come into play depending on its exposure to wind, decay, and so many other factors. So as a landowner, what can you do? So if you follow uh, the recommendations of some of these uh, certification uh, plans, uh, you would leave two to five uh, trees. Some people would say to scatter them about. So from a biological point of view, maybe best to scatter them uh, over the acreage. Uh, however, due to wind throw and some of these things, uh, some researchers have found that it's a little more practical maybe to uh, to leave them in a clump so they can uh, assist each other with, uh, with, with wind forces. Uh, also may be easier uh, when the timber harvest is done to work around a clump of trees um, and not uh, overly damage uh, them. Uh, not that in the case of a, a snag we're worried about uh, superficial damage as in knocking branches loose but we may be uh, not wanting to, to knock the entire uh, half of the tree away, in, in which case we have a shorter lived uh, snag. Another great place obviously to, um, to reserve uh, some snags and, and it's good for both the re uh, retention of current snags and also the recruitment of future snags would be to utilize the riparian areas or any stream side management zones that you would have on the property. In Virginia, obviously in the Chesapeake Bay area, stream side management zones are mandatory. And in the remainder of the state, um, most uh, owners and uh, operators will voluntarily leave stream side management zones to keep the soil intact and also to provide wildlife benefits for the future. So these areas uh, have the added benefit uh, of, of having a large um, grouping of trees together to protect for, from some wind throw, uh, as well as being near water sources and providing a corridor for wildlife to travel as well. To create snags uh, would be to selectively kill some trees uh, that are intentional uh, for this purpose. And to do that you could either girdle uh, using a chainsaw or a, a machete uh, where you scrape uh, a certain amount of the bark away. Um, perhaps an easier way to do that would be uh, with the use of herbicides uh, as in 
uh, one of the previous 15 minutes in the forest videos that we did on alternative methods uh, of herbicide application. So trees girdled in the summertime will die more quickly than trees girdled uh, at the other times of year. However, you may want to keep in mind for certain species, particularly pine and black cherry, uh, and I think maybe some others, uh, you may want to research first and make sure you're not going to initiate a beetle infestation by doing this in the summertime. Often to do it uh, later in the year in the dormant season uh, when insects aren't uh, attracted to the scents of the tree uh, may be a, a better practice to do. So as we mentioned, the longevity uh, differs by species. So certain species like cottonwood or yellow poplar are not going to uh, last very long, whereas other species such as white oak and, and black locust would be a longer term uh, snag in the landscape. So as a general rule, we'd be looking at trees uh, 15 inches and greater of diameter at breast height, uh, at least say 75 feet tall. So lastly, I'll mention snags in the urban environment. For certain, uh, certainly snags are uh, needed and desired in an urban environment. Uh, however, uh, they're a lot more prime for conflict in this uh, situation where they may be uh, considered a falling hazard or a health hazard uh, for the surrounding uh, area as well as an aesthetic uh, eyesore to some people. In this case, again, it is sometimes easier to leave these uh, dead trees in riparian areas where people have less access, less chance of uh, falling hazard uh, to occur. And also uh, tends to be an area that wildlife would be present uh, anyway. I have seen some instances where landowners uh, desire to leave uh, snags for wildlife benefits. However, that uh, conflicted with the beautification ordinances of a neighborhood. In some, and in some cases, uh, the landowner could seek a permit and, um, and modify the snag somewhat by removing uh, the top of the bowl and leaving mainly the, um, the trunk at a certain height so that it's not a, um, it is not a falling hazard uh, and still retain some wildlife uh, benefits. However, that not every locality uh, is willing to uh, negotiate this, so you would have to check that out with your locality. Thank you for joining us for another issue of 15 Minutes in the Forest. Make sure you join us next week where Karen Snape will take us on a hike to look at topo topographical features.